Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Fuji Sports. For geese, rash guards, mats, whatever the fuck you need in your life, Fuji Sports is there. I just saw the mats up at Joe Rogan's gym. They were tremendous. And as far as the geese are concerned, you know me, bro. I'm three bills. People try to pull, they tug, and that fucking gi is still fucking tougher than that. I don't care which one you get. Whether you get the lightweight ones, the separitos, the element, they're the best gi out there. Like I said, me, I go with the separito. But if you like it, go to check out church and get 10% off. Fujisports.com, check out church and get 10% off. A beautiful gi delivered right to your home. Number two, if you're doing that gi, you need some supplements. That's where Ana comes in, motherfuckers. Whether it's the Shroom Tech Sport or the Shroom Tech Immune, which Lee doesn't take. That's why he's got bronchitis every 90 fucking days. <laughs> You'll be tip top, my goo. You eat some ass, some alpha brain, and who's better than you? Again, on the way out, check out on it. And what are you pressing? Church. C-H-U-R-C-H and get 10% off. And the goods get delivered right to your fucking house. Who's better than you? Kick this motherfucking mule, Lee. There you have it. A little Michael Shang, the old fucking school for you. You got Uncle Joey. You got my fucking sidekick, the flying Jew, eating his little Jew cough drops. You got like 10 bags for fucking $2 at CVS. You got to get the good deal. Got to get the Lutons. You know what I'm saying? Vicks. They've been around since even fucking Jesus took Vicks once he left the cave. <laughs> Vicks vapor rub on your chest. You do a couple bong hits. You want to put some vapor, vapor rub on my chest not, for me? Not really. I don't do that type of shit. You got the wrong fucking guy. Go hang out with your little buddies over there in North Hollywood <laughs> where they got the movie screens and guys fucking. I'm sure you'll find somebody to rub some vapor rub on your ass and your little asshole, and then they'll stick that dick in it, and it's all over the shop. That's old school faggotry. When they put Vaseline around, uh, when they use Vicks vapor rub and they stick their fucking dick in it, that's called fucking... Uh, the dick of debt. I don't know. Fire dick. I don't fucking <laughs> Mint know. dick. Anyway, it was a great week. I want to thank Dean Delray for putting me on the show at the Avalon with Nikki Six and Rudy Sarzo and the guy from Anthrax. And it was just uh, a great time. But I learned something that night. Number one, I went up there and I rushed through my material. But that's not what I learned. I learned that the last fucking three years I've been going through something. I don't know what it is. It's not a midlife crisis. It's not... Something has been missing. You know, I've had it working out. And I try to, you know, get involved in my daughter's life. And I got the podcast in the road. But the other night when I was at that show, something hit me that we had discussed in the podcast about a year and a half ago with Rudy. And I didn't, it's not that I didn't buy into it. It's that I didn't think it was that important. And that's the element of live music. I really, listen, man, what we did growing up in North Bergen was go to concerts at Madison Square Garden. When these guys call in, a Villo or fucking Timmy the Teamster or these guys, <laughs> we went to, every, we were blessed to have the opportunity to go to a lot of shows, man. And I mean, I went to see everybody from Kenny Rogers to, to, to fucking Iron Maiden. I didn't give a fuck. And I would go, and it wasn't, something happened like in the mid 80s where I, I don't know I, I don't know what happened I became a criminal and I didn't think the live shows were that important anymore I mean I had friends that lived for that shit when the people I hung out with in Snowmass when I first moved to Snowmass you worked Monday through Friday and Saturday morning in the middle of the night you left for Colorado Springs or Denver or you know uh, Fort Collins and you'd catch a band live you know these guys traveled and I think I did it one or two times with them. I just, you know, I worked hard. I didn't have, the, I couldn't afford that shit no more. I, it was either between the blow and rent or fucking going to the Springs and watching a band. And th these guys, like 19 of them lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And they had moved to Colorado just to ski, you know. And they all had two jobs. They all worked on the mountain in the daytime so they could get a free ski pass. And then they all worked at restaurants or bartending or security at hotels or at hotels at night. All of them. So they were all there, and it was the weirdest thing. 19 people in a two-bedroom, sleeping bags everywhere, you know, uh, guys everywhere. They had, like, three girls that lived there from Minneapolis. They were all from Mankato, Minnesota. And it was just interesting how these guys lived there. And they partied during the week. 
If you went up there any night, of, any night of the week, you could find somebody awake in a corner fucking smoking weed. It was the weirdest fucking apartment I ever saw. Nobody cooked there. It was clean. It was spotless. But it was 19 guys living up there in three rooms, basically. Just because they wanted to party, though, the rest of the time. Well, they figured at the time rent was cheap as it was. This is 83, 84. Got it. And they wanted to get the most out of life, and they felt that their home living didn't really matter. <clears throat> so that's what they fucking did. But anyway, while I was at that show that night, I did the show, and then what Dean did was he had everybody switch up. So one song, it would be Anthrax and uh, this other guy and the drummer from the Black Crows, and then the next three songs would be Marin, who I have to congratulate, did a fucking great job on the guitar on Down Payment Blues. They, they, they did it a little on the edgy side, edgier side, but what was really weird was Dean Delray. How much I thought about Dean since that night. You know, every fucking day I wake up to six or seven messages on Facebook. And I answer them, you know, as much as I can. But out of those six or seven messages, it's three guys who would think they're pulling the wool over my eyes. You know, they want this, they ask for that, they want this. You know, you have to understand that I'm out there at night. I have my ear to the grind like everybody else is who's a comic. And when I don't hear your name and I hear you making requests and stuff like that, you're cutting corners in my world. And there's nothing that bothers me more than guys that think they can cut corners on my expense. I'm the type of guy that if I see you're hustling, I will give you any opportunity or do anything for you in the world. But if I don't know you, and I don't know if you're hustling, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, and you just hit me up demanding stuff, that's not right. You know, I have friends here, D'Agostino, Kate Quigley, fucking Lee. I got 10 guys that I know that are close to me that are out seven nights a week, week after week, you know, I see them tweeting, I see them Facebooking, I see them replying to messages. I see these people working. You know, they have a podcast, they're always on time with their podcast. And these guys aren't selling out arenas and you don't know them. And you don't need to know them. The most important thing is that they're working. They work constantly. Listen, yesterday we got off the, we got on the, the car picked me and Dean up at 4.15 in the fucking morning. We basically went to bed at fucking 12.30. We both got on the plane. I fell asleep for an hour. I don't even remember falling asleep. I got up. I went home. I picked up my daughter and my wife. Went out to breakfast. And then I went home and I had to fall asleep for a few hours. I got up. I had to do paperwork. I had to answer a bunch of emails, shit like that, from the two days that I was gone. I had to prep this week. And then... You know, I, I just stayed in with the family last night. I went out with Mercy yesterday in the afternoon. We went for frozen yogurt, and we we stopped at this other place. Today, I took her to crypto therapy with me. She watched me froze. She took pictures. She couldn't believe there was snow in there. So, not Dean. Dean was fucking waking up. He was getting home to, to go home to take a nap, to wake up, to go do two fucking spots last night. And tonight, he's got three fucking spots. You know, Dean isn't a name. Dean isn't somebody, but Dean don't stop. He moved to Hollywood so he could walk to the clubs. So he could have easier access to the clubs. So he could do spots every month. You know, I see Dean. When, if you went to this show, I applaud but you. But you also saw what Dean put together. He put together great comedy. And he put together a great band all by himself. He didn't bother anybody. He didn't fucking, you know, he asked them outright. And I respect that. That gets my respect in a huge way because there's so many people who are confused that you think that you're going to take a shortcut and your life is going to change. And guess what? I used to be the same too. And I got burnt three or four times and I stopped shortcutting. I realized that the main goal of a comedian is to be the funniest person he could be. When I came out here, I booked a pilot, and I booked a big-time commercial. But one night, I got my light fucking 
I got the shit kicked out of me at the improv in between Nick the, uh, Nick DiPaolo and Doug Stanhope. And I'll never believe that that night, I remember wanting to leave in the middle of the night just to disappear on the road to become a better comic. Like, I took any gig I could for two years on the road, from 98 to 2001. I did every shit fucking gig haul I could because I knew the payoff was going to be funny. It wasn't about the movies. It wasn't about the TV. And that's what I see the biggest fault in this town is with comedians, that they do comedy for five or six years, they kind of get good on it, then they get a show, and they stop doing comedy. The show ends, now they can't get work, and they want to fall back on comedy, but they're six years behind because they never thought about comedy those six years. You always continue getting on stage. I always knew that no matter what, if I kept getting on stage, I'd eventually be funny. That's the fucking final result of it. The more you get on stage and put yourself in uncomfortable situations, the funny you'll become. You know, Kate went to New York, Jersey, the Stress Factory, and tonight she's in Helium. That's like one of the toughest fucking clubs. That's Philadelphia. Where you have to bring it. And you know what? People bitch about Kate, bop, 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 bop. But let me tell you something. And I'm going to tell you how people bitch about Kate that my wife went out one night with Felicia to a comedy club. And a comic said something to my wife. And my wife came home and said, like, what? And I go, listen to me. I go, for every woman that cries about they're not getting spots or the comedy store doesn't give them spots, there's 20 Sarah Tianas and Kate Quigley's and Esther Coos that are out every night fucking fighting. When you see them, they're not bitching at all about anything. They're just telling you that they came from doing two spots and they came to the comedy store to see if they could get on such and such as belly room show. They're not complaining to me at all. I give those women fucking tons of credit. It's the women that come up to me and go, I can't believe you're still doing spots at the store because they don't give spots to women. Let me, let me tell you something, Mitzi Shaw was a woman. Let's see, sure gave out fucking spots to women every night. If I saw the schedules from when I first started, I still have them at the fucking house. I got 20 schedules from when I started. And when all this shit started talking, people, women started talking about the store, I went back and looked at those schedules. It was always the same. Three women a night, two women a night. They're sitting there going, it was like, whatever. That's why I gave I give Kate Quigley and Sarah Tiana and the women I put on my podcast the respect that I do. Because when I see them, they're not looking for a handout. They're out there fucking banging it out. And that's the most important thing to me in the fucking world when I see you. So before you come up on Facebook and say to me, hey, man, can you do this or can I do that? or can I? I don't even fucking know you. I don't even know you. How can you do something like that and put me in that type of position? And then if I say no, I'm supposed to feel like a fucking bad person. That's not right to me either. And even if you did know them, you can't. You, it, 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 that's not enough to put you on. Listen, them. I know a thousand people who I could put on this fucking podcast that are out there working hard every day. I think about those people constantly because I want to put them on when I can get the most out of them. Do you understand what I'm trying to say to you? I want to get them on before something that they're doing is blowing up or they're in the process of blowing up. I could put certain comics on here every fucking day if I wanted to. But what's the use? They're not on Twitter. They're not on Facebook. They're not hustling. It's a waste of a fucking guest. Because whatever they're saying is bullshit. They're just trying to fucking get on here because they think it's a one-hit pony. The way people think that if you get on Rogan one time, your life is going to change. No. It's how you act during Rogan, after Rogan. That makes a decision, whatever product you're selling or whatever proof, or whatever point you're trying to prove or whatever album you're trying to sell, that's what you get the opportunity on Rogan. But most people think, oh, well, I, I just go on some of these podcasts and my life will fucking change. That's a horrible way of looking at things. When I was coming up, it was if you went on Letterman or Leno, your life would fucking change. I never fucking emailed them. I knew I'd never get on those shows because I'm not CBS for fucking NBC friendly. 
I, I don't know if it's, if it's related, but it seems cause I, like since I've started, I see what other young comics are doing, and I li- I've heard like advice you give me, like similarly, like don't go to the store, the Improv, or the Laugh Factory until they ask you to go there. Is it like because you don't want like if it's the same thing if they came on here or another podcast, they're there, but they might they're not they might not be really ready for it yet, even no matter how much you like them. Well, always remember when you go to those big clubs. They remember you when you first start, and that's the memory they have of you in their head. Right. That's why so many comics are pissed off locally, because they'll start, let me just say, I'll just say a city like Michigan, and once the hottest club in Michigan don't like them, they have to adjust their game. They have to leave. And they'll, they'll ask for years, Jesus Christ, that's my own backyard, and they won't give me a fucking MC spot. Because they still remember the night you went in there and ate a bag of dicks. And then you disappeared. And you might be a bit a little better now. And even though they hear about you and stuff, you weren't part of that clique. So you get fucking dick. So it's better. I think that's a good way. I mean, but, but how, like on the other side of it, though, if you never ask or if you're not being assertive, how do you get into places or how do you get on the podcast? Honest to God, they hear about you. People talk, Lee. I hear names every other fucking day. By accident, Lee. By accident. I'll bump into somebody in 7-Eleven, and they'll say they went to the store the other night, and they fucking loved Theo Vaughn. They couldn't believe Theo was so fucking funny. Right, yeah. Or Jesus fucking Trejo, I hear his name. Or, you know, when you hear these people, you hear about them. You hear that they're making a wave. They're doing something. They went on somebody's podcast and she shaved the pussy on the podcast. They did something that was true. That's not, I could see through what the motion is. There's people who think they're doing things and they don't know that what they're trying to do. We see it. We were there. We were at your level when we were desperate also. I was desperate many a fucking time. But that doesn't mean I'm going to call Ben Affleck's mother. When I do a one woman, when I do a one man show in Boston to get Ben Affleck to show up at my show, I know a guy who did that. That's yeah. That's it's when you say it, it sounds crazy, but then I don't know. I feel bad for these people sometimes. Like I feel bad. Like how do you? Maybe you just feel like you're taking a shot. Well, at some point, like Rudy has said on this podcast before, one of his first visits on this podcast. Rudy Sarzo spoke about a thin line between musicians and mental health. Same thing goes with comedians. Same thing goes with fucking comedians. It's a thin fucking line. You've seen it. There's nights you and I have gone out high to comedy clubs way before you even screamed of doing an open mic. Yeah. And I would go, what's the matter? And you go, that comedian creeps me out. That comedian creeps me out. That comedian creeps me out. Don't fucking tell me. You remember? Don't make me say fucking names. Oh, yeah, I absolutely You I had a couple guys that you, you, you would get high, and they would drive you fucking insane. They start running material or... Yeah, oh, it's crazy. And they don't know that you... You know what I'm saying? Like, you, I'm in the business. Knock it off. Smarten the fuck up. And it's not their fault. It's not their fault. You know... I probably did the same fucking thing. But then you learn that you have to work from strength, not from weakness. That's a really weird sentence. To yeah, what do you understand. mean by that? You have to work from your strength. For years. Until about four years ago when the word got out. I would get, let's pretend they're in MySpace, in the beginning of Facebook. I would get, hey, Joey, how are you? Big fan of the fucking podcast. We have a proposal for you, for you and Joe Rogan to come do my fucking Christmas party. You know, that makes me feel bad because you really don't want me. You really want Joe Rogan, but you just don't. He's not replying to your stupid fucking emails. Right. He th- he thinks he's going to go down the line. So the word got out over the years that nobody plays that shit. So those type of emails stopped. 
Really? Yeah. They got, yeah. Nobody. We don't play. There's no reason to play. Don't play. Unless you come direct to me with something, don't come to me for Joe. I used to torment people. I would love when people would fucking actually call me and say, can you have Joe's number? And I go, yeah, sure. Grab a pen. And they'd grab the pen. I'd give them a minute. And I'd go, all right. And I'd go, here it is, CAA. And I would give them, like, whatever the agency number is. And they would just be quiet on the other end. They would just silence because they thought they were going to get a fucking handout. And I just threw them to the wolf. I threw them directly to the wolf. And they don't even have the balls to say, no, 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 no. Do you have his number? And I'm going to go, listen, the best advice for you that I have is to call the agency. You call him personally, he's going to come over and stab you in the lung. You'll be walking around like Lee with bronchitis for a month. I'm surprised you didn't like find a place named like Rogan's Hardware and give them that number or something. Just a mess with just a, like a fake number. Because like, like, I, can't, I can't imagine... It went on for years. I would wake up to messages from people how much they fucking love me. <laughs> but can I come with? Can I bring Rogan with me? And and they throw some figure at us, like some number. And, and I'm supposed to call Joe and tell him. I wouldn't even have the heart to say something like that to him. I wouldn't even have the heart to say something. But for years, me and Ari. Do you remember the guy in San Jose? He was going to do a a reality show with Death Squad and he finally settled with little Esther and Sam Tripoli and then Sam Tripoli started calling me and telling me the guy's real the guy couldn't be real if his life depended on it he just wanted to do get Joe Rogan on a stupid fucking podcast or something would you guys get like emails like the same day like <laughs> no we would get the, what happened was Tripoli told me about the guy and right there I knew the guy just went down the totem pole he went from Rogan. He couldn't get a hold of Rogan. He got. He went through Ari. Ari told him to go fuck himself. He went through me. I told him I wasn't interested. Then they go to Duncan. Then they go to Red Band, and Red Band seems a little interested, but he won't throw Joe Rogan under the bus. He knows better. <laughs> so he's kind of lost in it because without Rogan, they don't want Red. You know what I'm saying? Like, you really feel shitty. You really get to understand what people want. Yeah, that's And all. they don't want you. They don't want you. They want Rogan. They don't want you. They're just putting smoke up your ass to try to put a reality show together or whatever mind fuck they put in their mind. I've gotten some of those. Even even before the podcast, I, I worked on Hell's Kitchen once, and this girl that I went to high school with was a chef, and she wanted me to introduce her to Gordon. I was, I was an assistant editor. I never met Gordon Ramsay, but people think, I don't know. It just I, it, it, make, it, it kind of does make you sad. It makes you sad. And then when you realize, when they realize that they can't get nothing from you, then there's no more conversation. And that makes yeah. you even sadder. You go, wow, that's all you were about. You know, that's all you were about. You, you said something to me uh, last week. You said, like, anyone who texts me, happy Easter. Like, I, like you, you like, Donnie, I wish they wouldn't even text me. Like, you, you, you can see that that's all they're doing it for. Yeah, no, no, no. If you want to attack somebody happy Easter, go fuck yourself. If you're not going to pick up the fucking phone, why are you texting me happy fucking Easter for? It's the weirdest thing when people text you Merry Christmas. And especially when it's like a group text. <laughs> you're like, really? You fucking lazy sack of shit? That's what burns me up about that stuff. But no, uh, you know, when you, you go through all these levels as a comic, and even now with the podcast... It's it's hilarious how when I'm going to go to a town, I'll get three emails from people to do a podcast that I don't fucking know. Like, so you want me to get in the car with a guy that I don't fucking know if he just smoked meth to go to somebody's basement to do a podcast because you're going to get me high. Wow. Why am I so fucking lucky? How was I blessed to get this fucking gift? Like, do you, are you fucking serious? Do you really think I'd get in a stranger's fucking car and go to somebody I've never even heard of? Would you, do would you used to, though? Maybe not a podcast, but no, would you get in a stranger's no, car? No, 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 no. They work at the club. They say, no, somebody was selling blow. Yeah, I'll get in that fucking car. But to do a podcast, I don't know you. I don't know you. I don't know your fucking podcast. I don't know, I don't know who you are. What do you expect from me? If I don't know who you are, what do you expect from me? 
I don't. I don't. I think these people maybe they think that they that they do know you because of the podcast, or maybe they just think they're a good person. Like that's what I Look, think. Uh, something really weird happened in Albuquerque. That was brilliant. That's the first time. Well, it's happened before. It's happened in different cities before. A guy yelled. He made a U turn. He pulled over. He pulled up next to me. And I went up to the car and said hello. And I talked to him for a couple of minutes. He told me his name was Esteban. And I could just tell the guy had a good heart. He wasn't talking about podcasts. He wasn't talking about anything. He was just talking about humanity. And you know, he listens to this podcast and that podcast. And he showed me weed. Like, to be to show me he was real, he flipped his fucking badge of weed. And he goes, I'm real. And I go, you know what? Take me to eat some Mexican food. And we drove for like 10 minutes and we talked about the city and he showed me this and he showed me that. And we went and we got some Mexican food. And it was one of the best days of my fucking life. I got to be honest with you. Because, yeah, he knew who I was from the podcast. But B, he didn't want anything from me. He just wanted my friendship. And I could tell just from the fucking beginning that that's it. And that's a gift that a lot of people don't get to see. And that Really, he just wanted my friendship. We went to lunch. Lunch was fucking delicious. We got back in the car. He rolled another joint. We made a periscope. Then he drove me back to the hotel like nothing. I couldn't see him the next day because I went to Winkle John. We were going to get together and go to a different fucking uh, Mexican food place. But I went to Winkle John's and I was fucking wiped out. I wanted to give a good thanks to uh, the Winkle John... And my man Greg Jackson for taking care of me, the guy with the mitts, their podcast. I mean, what a great time I had there. I met a Puerto Rican kid that was a fighter there. They have dorms there. It was just a real honor to go in there and just hit the mitts for three fucking rounds because I could not breathe in that altitude at all. I hit the mitts. I threw some kicks. Greg Jackson throw, taught me how to throw some elbows and shit. And that was sensational just to see what that gym's all about. They got everything there i don't think it's open to the public it's just open to amateur fighters and real fighters you know that they have dormitories there lee they have apartments there i mean it's the fucking coolest place you have they have two doctors on duty there that work on you after you fucking hurt yourself and shit it is kind of it's kind of like going to college it's it's tremendous it's like the comedy store of fighting and you're training there with greg jackson like i looked at their schedule like I, they contacted me and said if I would do the podcast. And I was like, fuck yeah, I'll do the podcast. And when I did the podcast, I'm like, well, I might as well go there and do a kickboxing class. So I looked at the schedule, and they had a class at 10 o'clock. But it wasn't no kickboxing class. It was a ground and pound class. And I'm like, listen, not for nothing, I'm 55 years old. I like to go in there and throw a couple kicks for Jesus, jump on top of the box, a couple kettlebells, I'll do the circuit training. I'll kick the shit out of the bag. I'll punch the shit out there's of the no bag. There's no ground and pound. But there's no ground and pound in Uncle Joey's life. I don't want to be on top, and I don't want to be on bottom. <laughs> I don't even want to be anywhere in that fucking position I don't want to be the whatsoever. ref. No, I don't want to be the ref. I don't want to know nothing. They're like, no, it's beginners <laughs> and some of the fighters. No, 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 no. I'm 55. <laughs> I bend over the punch. I might not bend back. I got three fucking shows sold out in fucking Albuquerque. I can't be grounded and fucking pounded. What are you crazy? That's when people go crazy. They, the actors and shit and Hollywood people, they go to these gyms and they start fucking boxing. And I've seen these actors like at Justin Fortune's gym that they would go down there. Guys, you wouldn't believe it. After six weeks, all of a sudden, they're fucking Muhammad Ali. They're shadow boxing. They're hitting the mitts. And they're looking at boxers that are real boxers, like menacing. Like, look at me. I'm an actor. I'll fuck you up. And Justin Fortune, that motherfucker, God bless him so. Every once in a while, he listens to the actor. And he'll go, okay, I'll set something up with you for Thursday at 9 o'clock. The actor walks in there thinking he's fucking going to do anything. And next thing you know, the actor gets blasted in the head twice with, those, that, with the head guard on. Ooh, and night. it's all over. Good night. The guy's like, Jesus Christ, I've never been hit that, that hard. Because hitting pads with your trainer and kicking the bag is completely different than trying to be fucking Joey Mozzi. You follow me? My Joey Mozzi days are fucking over. Well, it's kind of crazy. Like, even going like going back to this, like, people, what people ask you in this town, I just had my, had my headshots done, and Troy Conrad made me feel like I was a male model. So I can't imagine 
being an actor or being someone who's has a little heat behind them and everything that they everyone that everyone sees is oh you're amazing well oh, first off when those actors get sent to a, a trailer like that they're getting paid 400 500 bucks an hour for 400 five bucks an hour lee i'll tell you you look like arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> do you understand me for a nickel an hour lee i'll tell you whatever the fuck you want to hear i've never seen anyone like this you know and everybody got to remember that some of those trainers listen to you so some of those Hollywood trainers basically listen to you. You're giving them a nickel. The An first hour. 15 minutes, you're stretching, really. Oh, help me stretch. And then the next 15 minutes, maybe you fucking lift some weights. And then 10 minutes, you get a phone call from your agent that you absolutely positively have to take. Mm-hmm. And then you do something, some bullshit, fucking toe raises for 10 minutes. And then it gets a nickel an hour. But there's people like Brad Pitt. There's real actors that take trainers Keanu Reeves, and they fucking, they work five hours a day. You know, they do everything. Pyrometrics, they're jumping off fucking boxes, they're weightlifting, they're doing kettlebells, they're strength training, they're getting military, you know, Tom Cruise. Those guys are all fucking in. You give Tom Cruise a role, watch him, even in Tom Hatch or whatever that fucking Yeah, well, they're is. getting 20 million. Yeah, so you got to put 10, 6, 7, 8 weeks of preparation into it, maybe three months. Why not? If you're going to give me $20 million for a fucking movie, but the, at the end, listen to me. Whether you're getting $20 million or whether you're getting scale for the day, if you get that job, you still got to do the homework. But to, to, it, does it vary? Like, if you got a job for scale, would you lose 50 pounds? Like, would you gain 20 pounds? If the role called for it and I felt it was worth it, I would do whatever I can. First off, I'm not one of those actors. They wouldn't come to me at one of those method fucking movies. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's, they know who's an actor. I'm a Hammonegger. I'm not an actor. I just figured out how to play myself, and it's cute, and I do it. Like, I'm shooting tomorrow. I'm shooting the Greg Garcia show. Uh, the guest book. The guest book, thank God. Uh, he gave me a little role, and, like, I'm shooting tomorrow. I'm no fucking pro. I've read the scene 20 times, and even though it's just a few lines, you know, I had to get high and look at the scene and break it down and see if I could stretch a line out. You know, I'm a pro, but I'm still a ham and anchor as an actor. I'm not going to lie to nobody and tell you, oh, I went to acting class for six weeks, and I fucking, no. I went to acting class for, like, eight weeks. Mm-hmm. I went to, like, three different teachers. But I finally realized that the best acting I was doing was on stage. It sharpened up my fucking, my uh, timing. Acting is timing. And timing is everything. Stand-up is timing. So your acting classes helped your stand-up? They all helped everything. They all helped everything. But what happens is now, when I go to an acting class, I just get bored. I'm not going to lie to you. I can't see paying three bills for the amount of acting that I do per month to hang out with people very seldom when I go to those acting classes can I rock and roll with people they can't rock and roll with me in the scenes I already been in big time scenes and these are like young startups yeah I already been in big time scenes G they don't have like a I don't even know what you'd call so it I've already for been you. intimidated by Melissa Leo I've been intimidated by fucking Adam Sandler I've been intimidated by Robert De Niro. I've been intimidated by a ton of fucking people, you know, from Dean Cain to, to, to fucking Denzel. I've been intimidated by a lot of people. You're not going to intimidate me. Bro, I was in a room with James Coburn. Fuck. You know how intimidated what I was? But after the first line, I started making eye contact, and that's what acting's all about. Because you have to let him know you're in the fucking room too, cocksucker. But it has to transcend through your eyes. Your eyes are everything. That's why before you go into an audition, they always tell you to think of the moment before. What the character you think, what the character was doing the moment before. Your imagination tells you what. Before he comes in here to shoot you in the fucking head. Was he outside doing jumping jacks? Was he in his car saying goodbye to his daughter? Was he, you know what I'm saying? So as you're walking up the stairs, what's your thought? You have to go there when you go into an audition with a scene. And I'm just using that as a, it could be you walking into a room to fire somebody. It could be a thousand different well, things. Do you think you're better at, even like just, if we're going to break down acting. Do you think you're better at improvising? 
than like a trained actor is just because of your stand up? Like, I think okay, be, be let's on be your honest feet. here. I always say that I've been doing comedy since 1991. I didn't really focus on the writing and the whole art aspect of it till 93. So, in reality, on paper, my first two years of comedy were garbage. But there was something else I learned those two years why they're not garbage, why I have to count them. Because I was a house MC at the broker in Boulder. And I MC'd there every week for $50 a week. And I bombed pretty much every fucking week. Jesus. So I gave up on material. And I became a men provisor. And at that time, I started doing comedy at a black club called Club Mix off East Colfax. Black night on Sunday nights. You had to improvise, Lee. So not, I improvised till 1997. It got less and less because down in L.A. you can't improvise. When there's agents in the room and you start talking to the audience and trying to be cute. There's no more nothing. But I mean, now I you don't, I don't know if you improvise, but you're you don't have a set list. Oh no 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 no! I improvise on stage every fucking show. There's a line that'll come out whether you like it or not. That there's improvised material, because when I started as a comic, the first six months I believed that I could be a writer, but I bailed on it. And so what I would do is get one hook to go into a show, and then I, I rested on my laurels of improvising. So my show became 50-50. So let's say you called me up and said, Joey, I got a show for you. You got to do 30. Even though I know I have 30, I got 18. But I'm going to improvise for 12 and pray to God that it all works out. Ooh, and how often will it work out, though? Not too many. Ooh. <laughs> not too many. It's a long time to improvise. That's 12 minutes of improvising. So, But guess what, Lee? One out of every five shows, I hit a home run out of the park with the improvising. And that would convince you to stick with it? And that would convince me to stick with it. I went to Seattle in 95, and I still, because I went to New York for nine months. And then in New, in New York, people come out and go, How you doing? My name is Lee. I had a fucked up day today. What do you do, sir? You're a bus driver. You like being a bus driver? So that's New York humor. So when I went to New York, I fell into more of that fucking stupidity humor where you talk to the audience. When I got to Seattle in 95, I still had that stupidity humor that I'd talk to in the audience. Once when things got dangerous, I got into a mode where I would go into improvising into the audience. And sometimes, Dean, uh, Dean, uh, sometimes, Lee, it was fucking phenomenal, but sometimes it was just god awful. Would you do that at open mics, too? I'd do it everywhere. Fuck. I thought in the back of my mind I was fucking Johnny Improvised for a long time. And it got me nowhere. But it did get me material. I was gonna say, and it did teach me how to take chances. So if you, if you improvised and found something you liked, you'd write it down at the end of the night? Fuck yeah. Okay. But what I mean improvising also is talking to the audience. Crowd work. Crowd work. Crowd work is a bad habit. If you're doing it right now, God bless you. I'm not putting you down at all. But I never liked crowd work. And I did it. And I did it well. But again, it was 50-50. So here I was going on stage with the set people. So let's say I had, let's pretend that I had 15 minutes. I would have three minutes of material. Then I would improvise for three. And if that didn't work, I bailed out on the fucking talking to the audience. And uh, eat I, shit constantly. It seems like a very like a like a coin toss, like because you don't know if they're gonna say this something. This is what good. I'm saying to you. I haven't even tried to get. This really. is what I'm saying to you, and that, you do that so much that your life sucks. I mean, there's after a year, your life really sucks. Why does it suck? Because you're not getting nowhere, and uh -huh. you know you're not getting nowhere because you're scared to actually sit down and use your fucking pen. This is how it was for me. I refused to sit down and use my pen. Then in 96 in Seattle, something came over me. And I started making notes while I was driving. And that was pretty effective. Notes while I was driving. Just little notes. So again, I would come up with a, up about, a joke about Lee. I'd come up with a joke about King Kong. 
I come up with a joke about a song. I mean, there was no particular order. And I would go up on stage with those two lines, which were funny, 50% of the time, 60% of the time. But the rest of it, you know, I'll give you an example. When you drive from Seattle or Yakima, Washington, Yakima, Washington is considered the Palm Springs of Washington. Okay. Okay. I had a gig there one night. And I walk into the fucking hotel room. I lock the door. I put my luggage down. I'm happy as shit. It's a nice hotel. But when I look in the bed, it's one of those beds that if you put a quarter in it, it shakes. Oof. I never even saw one of those. Yeah, this is how young you are. Like, guys, in the 70s and 60s, when you checked into a hotel room, you could put quarters in the fucking head frame, and the bed would rattle. And it was like a, it was like a mini massage. That's what it was? Yeah. It was I thought it was a be, sex thing. Oh, my and, God. And maybe even a sex thing. I don't know. I was too fucking young. I saw it in Dumb and Dumber. That's the only place. But I, I went to this hotel in Yakima, Washington. <laughs> I fucking uh, put the, you know, I looked at this bed, and I was like, holy shit. I go, let me try it. And I put the fucking quarter in. I put the I put the first quarter in. It didn't work. And then I banged it a couple of times. And you know me being me. I put the second quarter in. I banged it, and finally it started fucking shaking. And it just made fucking noise like... You know, like the, like I was. I don't know what I weighed. I probably weighed two fifty at the time, two forty. It was like you with the zip line. It was just too much, and the thing kept making noises. And finally, it fucked up. So that night, I remember going up on stage. I was laughing my ass off because I was high. I went out. I went up on stage and I fucking uh, said, you know, it's great to be in Yakima. Uh, I went to my hotel room. It was a massage bed. I put a quarter in it. I woke up with a thumb in my ass, like something stupidly. Oh, because the Palm Spring. I, I, that's how bad I was, people. That's what I'm trying to say to you. I had no joke writing skills, but I had a way of saying something that I would hook on to something, and if God was smiling on me, I'd have three tags. And then eventually I would add, for years I did that Palm Springs joke. I forget it now. I'm not saying it right. Something happens. I put a quarter in there, and I had a thumb up my ass. That's the Palm Spring of Washington. I don't know. Bro, we all go through a lot of suffering. Please forgive me for that joke, but that's just to let you know I was no fucking Picasso, and you got to stay with it, you know? Where's, uh, where's my man at? For years, I had to follow Paul Mooney at midnight. When I was on the seven-year mark of comedy, I became a regular at the comedy store. And she would put me on four nights a week at 12.45 to 1 o'clock to 1.15. And it was hell late. You were going up for four people. You couldn't believe you were finally at the comedy store, but you didn't get the, the meat and potatoes of the audience every night. And then she started liking me, Mitzi Shaw. I was always around when she was around. She'd watch me and she'd giggle. I was always down there on Sunday nights. I drove the van. By the way, happy 46th anniversary to the comedy store. Without you, I'd have no fucking nothing. I'd be in prison right now. So thank God the comedy store opened, and I was blessed to be a part of it uh, since 1997, man. I'm really lucky that they made me a regular, because, Lee, nothing else would have made me stay here. That was the only thing that You think so? You would have left? Here. Yeah, because, I w Jesus Christ, it's a dream to be a regular at the comedy store. Never mind to be inducted by fucking Mitzi Shaw. That means something. Yes, that's, but, that's always meant something to me. Yeah, a lot of things happened in my life, but that's always meant something to me. I was a regular after two fucking auditions, man. Even Joe Rogan had to be a fucking unpaid regular for a while, guys. She made me a regular right off the bat, two fucking showcases. So for all the bad shit that happened and all the bombings I took all those years... It paid off because when I walked in there, I had the 10 minutes I needed. That was 10 minutes. When I moved from, when I left Seattle in 97, I was starting to get it. I wasn't talking to the audience because I had come to LA and I had looked around a few times. And I was given the tour and the advice. If you come down here, knock it off with talking to people. That's the biggest fucking foot in your mouth here. Interesting.
Is that still the, is that still the case? You know what? I would I would still perfect to it because I don't want to get that bad habit. There's bad habits and things that you do, whether we speak. It's, it, it happens for me. I always go, uh, do you see what I'm saying? Or whatever the fuck stupid sling I say at the end of my sentences. That's a bad habit. When I was a kid, I used to rebound. And instead of going up with the rebound, I dribbled the ball. It was such a bad habit that the fucking coach told me, every time you do it, 25 push-ups and 20 fucking sprints. It took me fucking two months to stop doing it. There's little things that we do, the bad habits, and then they become, you know, biting your nails and snorting coke, you know. They become bad fucking habits, but that you have to fucking correct and for you to get better in your field. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Whatever field that you want to excel at. I want you, not me, want whatever, I want you to bury yourself from time to time when it doesn't matter and work yourself out of a hole on purpose. I, it's hard now because I'm only doing five minutes most of the time. That's so it. I want to do. I want to do great. So what you want to do is you want to go up there with a topic, right? And remember, because you in your house writing is completely different when you have twenty eyeballs staring at you. Exactly. You follow me? Me telling you to give me your money like this, and me telling you with a forty-five bazooka in my fucking hand. Watch how quick you'll give me your wallet. Correct or not correct? Absolutely. So it it applies the same to writing comedy sometimes. Sometimes it's good to go on a limb up there just to test your mind. And you may come up with a fucking gem that changes the whole thing. That came out because it was supposed to be there. You said it. It came out from inside of you under pressure. Well, it is weird because one of the worst sets I had ever was earlier this week before I went up and did Sam Tripoli's room because I was trying to go through like a set list beat by beat and not and just remember like memorize it rather than just do it and it was I I had more of an improvised show I mean I was still doing the material that I'd written but I wasn't doing I was I wasn't all right a b c d and it was weird that the more I try to control it the worse it goes sometimes. Well, here you go. And this material, and this and this podcast doesn't apply to just comedians. This applies to salesmen. This applies to attorneys. This applies to anybody that we make a living in a weird, weird sort of way. You have to experiment, guys. <laughs> Plain and fucking simple. Yeah. And you got to learn what works for you. But guess who pushes you in your career? It's not your boss. It's not your mom because, you know, you're the first generation immigrant. It's got to be you. So sometimes you have to put yourself in an awkward position. You know, I I may have to do something tomorrow at 10 in the morning, right? Remember college, college. What do you think they, what do you think you go to college for? To teach you how to cram. You think they want to teach you how to cram? Cramming is something that if you get good at in your life and you know how to handle, your life will be great. Because you know what cramming is? Doing it all at once. Lacking of organization. Right. It doesn't take to your third semester in high school or your sophomore year. I got it my eighth grade year. When? After I got left back. Hello? It was too fucking late. So basically, you go to a fucking class. You take notes, you listen to the teacher, okay? You do the assignments, and every week, if you knew this going in, you would go over the material, wouldn't you, Lee? Yeah. Every Friday and Saturday, instead of dicking around for an hour, watching TV and hanging out with your friends, if you went over that material on Saturday and Sunday, when the quarterlies came, it would be a lot easier for you. You didn't have to go back and start from scratch like I'm on a look at a yay and study all over again. But you, it took me years. It took me getting left back to figure it out like that. Well, guess what? The same thing works for comedy. Cramming is comedy sometimes. Joey, what the fuck are you talking about? Cramming sometimes is going on stage yourself and pushing yourself to the limit. Forcing yourself to do something, taking a chance. You know what? I don't want to do this tonight at the fourth wall. I'm going to go to this 11 o'clock and make my life a nightmare. From time to time, I want you to go to a bar. 
that, you know they're not going to laugh at you. I want you to have that bar and cherish it. Even if they throw a bottle at you because you're not funny, I want you to make sure you go back there the next week. Because that's the essence of anything. Is to no matter what happens, you have to overcome it mentally. And it takes a lot with stand-up and musicians and... You know, we're not going to be perfect. That's hard to get over, though. Like, I, I'm, and I'm not saying I do great every time, but I'm disappointed when I don't. And I, I do. absolutely you're disappointed. And you know what? You should be, but you shouldn't be. How's that for you? Is that the most fucked up feeling in the world? That you should be, but you shouldn't be. And you're like, what the fuck are you saying, Ricardo? <laughs> You should be sad that you're bombed, but you should be proud that you went up. And that pride is what takes you into that next set. That next set is the crucial one. Because if there's a God above, right, and everything works out, guess what's going to happen? You're going to do well. You're going to bomb again. (laughs) No, I can't have that happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this happens with tests. This happens with sales proposals. This happens in construction when you put bids in. You're going to bomb again. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And guess what? If there's a God above and you catch the 5 o'clock, what's the pizza place you go to? Mont Pizza. Let's say you go to Mont Pizza and you do the 5 o'clock. Guess what? You'll probably eat a bag of dicks again. But now you'll get so frustrated that you go to the fourth wall. You'll look over your paperwork. You'll make modifications. You listen to all your tapes because I know you tape all your sets. And you'll switch it around and you figure it out. And then once you figure it out and you take a chance, that's when you get the rewards. That's when now the next three sets are brilliant because you changed it around. You renovated yourself. You got it in the arts. You got to keep reinventing yourself. It, that that's not even a fucking questionable thing. That's a that's constantly. I'm not. I don't live stressed out. I don't live, uh, you know, like with a gun to my head. And I, it's hard for me to write materially. By the way, your tag is really working on that bit about sucking dick out in the stars. Lee's a great bit. Lee could take a bit and really add to it. That's his gift right now. He. And he also has great ideas. Like the night I heard him tell the story. Listen, this is what America wants to hear. Lee, already at level one, was telling you what America wants to hear on The Tonight Show. That you know what? You really love your parents. But there's sometimes you don't want to answer the fucking phone. You know, that's number one. Jesus Christ. If the, I don't have parents, but I know how people feel because I'm like your parent. When I get your number, I call you like your parent. And you must go, this motherfucker, <laughs> this fucking guy's got to call me at 2 in the morning. You know what I'm saying? And then he told a joke about picking up his father at the airport. Like, come on, people. You're living wherever the fuck you're living. You got enough problems. You got kids. And now you have to pick your dad up at the fucking airport. Yeah, you're happy to see dad. But then he gets in the car and he gives you an a beat and he tells you about your life. And right away, you do want to make a U-turn and take him right back to the fucking airport. Those two things really made me laugh. He got rid of them. He got rid of them because he got smarter than that. He should take those two jokes and ride them till somebody tells Conan that he says those two jokes. There's a little Jew kid that says every time his mom calls him that he's got to fucking look at the phone and go, what now? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know what you said. It was so honest and it was true. But guess what happened? You started writing jokes. Yeah. I, you see, I we learn every day, huh? I haven't done those for a while. You think I don't pay attention? I pay attention to fucking everything. And when I go to those fucking fourth walls, I learn like a motherfucker. Even though I've been doing comedy 27 years, I leave there going, Jesus Christ. Lee has no idea what jokes he said tonight. Those are tonight show jokes with a fucking sensational delivery. If I had parents, I would have gave Lee $1,000 because I would have wrote a whole special about that. Especially if I was Jewish. Lee, take a G note and you're my road manager for the year. What are you talking about? I just want to be an open mind. Shut shut up. You're going on the road. You're doing 10 minutes and you're going to keep writing every fucking week because you wrote two jokes that are brilliant that America never wants to talk about. Everybody loves their mother. But Jesus Christ, on the third call, 
and it's not even lunchtime. You're like, what now? What now? What the fuck? You know, and he said it. He didn't say it that excitable because he didn't know what he had. And then, you know, to say those two jokes on like your seventh or eighth time on stage, you tapped into something. Look, at he's all red now in the face because that's what you do when you're a comic. You sit back there, you shut your mouth, and you absorb and you take a piece of every comic. You don't take that material. Right. You look at where they're going and you go, wow, I got to start taking my jokes there. It's a weird concept. And it, it, it is, it, it is <coughs> scary. I don't want to steal. So that I've it's no, been weird. You can never steal. How about Matthew Felico, Jimmy Shelter, Flo Combat, Lots Money, Clam Bait, Nathan Sturk, Front Row Brian always around. My new buddy, Esteban from New Albuquerque. I love you, motherfucker. I'm sorry I didn't see you Saturday Late Show. We're tight. I got your number. Don't worry about nothing. Chris Trent and Sandra Malta Love, Love Kio. Don't forget, sun, Saturday night, me and Lee are at the Ice House, 7.30 show. There's a few tickets left, and all that's left for Columbus is 4.19 the Thursday. Guys, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to add shows because I think I'm shooting fucking uh, that uh, show that week for uh, Showtime. So tomorrow I'm shooting the guest book. And I'm doing another episode of the guest book, and I'm doing this, whatever. And I appreciate you guys because you guys have been kept keeping me tip-top shape. You follow me ever since I got you guys in my life. I got to fucking walk the walk. I just can't come up here and talk bullshit to you people. There was something I had to tell you about, and I can't remember. Uh, and that's why. Like, ever since I started going to the fourth wall, and when I go to fly, like, when I got the spotted flappers, she tells me to get there and fucking... 9.30, that means I'm not going up till 10.15. I go at 9.15, I sit in the back, I get a water, and I just watch comedians, and I learn. I go, would I do that? Would I didn't do that? He's talking to the audience, he's talking too much to the audience. Sometimes, uh, but Lee, I also want you to react to the audience, okay? If a waitress walks into the thing and she falls over with a bag of drinks, you just can't keep doing jokes. Right. You gotta crack a joke, that's classy. Maybe make a movement to help her pick up the stuff. Do you follow me? And then get back on stage and start all over again. That takes a complete different fucking animal. So I also want you to be live and in the moment. And this is why Paul Mooney would always say, you have to get entertained to be a good entertainer. You have to, be a, you have to get entertained to write. When I'm having a hard time writing, I will always try to watch a movie, but for years there's been something missing. And I didn't realize what it was till last Tuesday night when Dean invited me to be part of his fucking little Shangala there. That I needed live music back in my life. You enjoyed that much? I enjoyed the energy and I enjoyed the learning. When I was a kid and I'd go see Judas Priest. I always knew Glenn Tipton was a better guitar player than K.K. Dowling. K.K. Dowling did leads, but I was always a Glenn Tipton guy. But K.K. Dowling was a performer. He shook his head. He danced. You find out the different aspects of selling a show, which is what a comedian does. We sell a show. The most brilliant conversation I ever heard about a comedian, the first time I ever tapped my back about being a comedian, was when I saw Roseanne on Larry King Live. And they interviewed her and they asked her about when she fired her staff, why she did that that year. And she goes, because I brought comedians in. Because comedians, we do everything. We produce, we write, we direct, we run the lights. We know exactly how to do everything. We just get fucking lazy. Once you use every weapon that you get along the way, this is why I say to you, Lee, and I say to a lot of people that, yes, give comedy a try. Give being a guitar player a try. If you want to play a harmonic in a band, go for it. Whatever the fuck you want to do, go for it. Because it may not work out, but it may lead you to the road that you end up on and become a millionaire. That'd be great. I, I, you already have the podcast game. Right. You already know the ups and downs of the podcast game. You see how we advertise. You see how we do this. You see how we do the Periscope. 
Now, you know, we have, we're, we're promoting the product. We're learning so much by doing this job. I've learned a complete different world that I did not know existed until the last seven years. Did I read a book, Lee? No. We got up at six in the morning into the podcast twice a week. And we learned a lot from that. And then we moved on to the afternoon. We learned we couldn't get guests to come in or call you at six in the morning unless they were on the mm -hmm. East Coast. You learn so many fucking aspects, but if you don't try it, you're not going to learn. And Trying things take you to the road that you need to fucking be on. How do I know? Because I'm living it right now. I'm seeing this right now. Jesus Christ, you think I saw this 20 years? I didn't fucking see this. You want me to tell you when I go to Santa Fe and three shows are sold out of Albuquerque at the beautiful Santa Ana Casino that, that I'm going to fucking tell you that I knew this, this was in the cards for me? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Did I tell you podcasting was coming, going to come along? Predicted it? Not at all. But this is the road it took me to. I wouldn't have known if I didn't get off the couch that June 18th of 1991. Wow. Well. And it was the same injection you're shot with right now. You get out there. You're out there at three shows. Whether it's the fourth wall or Carnegie Hall. You're still out there doing a fucking show. So just because you eat a bag of dicks. There's always a, a, a side story to this note. That you're, you're getting something from this. You're going to remember 20 years from now. Every time you go get sold at the 7-Eleven or a lottery ticket. You're going to look at that fourth wall and go, fuck, that building means a lot to me, even though now it's a fucking Russian dance school. Right, whatever it is. And the sushi place burnt down. And, you know. Thank God. But no, that's the really the point I wanted to talk about today is how I'm adding. I think I'm taking my wife on a date uh, Friday night and... Uh, I'm going to take it just to a random place to watch music. Doesn't matter what type of genre it is. When I was a kid, I watched from Kenny Rogers to Judas Priest to fucking Yes. So why don't I do it again if it's going to help my comedy? I can't tell you how much help I've gotten just from going to the fourth wall. And then how about going to the fourth wall and sitting there and watching eight guys doing five minutes. And then I get in my car and I go to the comedy store. And I see Dalia, Ron White, Rogan, and then I got to go up on stage. Think about my fucking world. Why I have anxiety, bitches. But I put myself through that. Because at both fucking ends of the spectrum, I learned something. So do you think you might try to learn an instrument? Or do you think just going and watch it live would be good? Well, I think I'm just going to go watch and entertain it and live it again. You go to a concert, you sit in the side... And you start looking around, and you figure out what this music means to people. It's the weirdest fucking thing. Me and Felicia were standing there, and I saw a guy with long hair, people, that was, if you can't watch it in the YouTube, Lee, I'll show you. He was moving his head like this. He wouldn't stop for this. He would only stop for the songs, and then he would start again, and his head would shake. And Felicia looks over, and she goes, I bet he's going to have a headache in the morning, you know. Whatever the fuck she said to me. But it didn't matter. That's what that music meant to him. It didn't have to be ACDC. Anybody could have been playing it. That's what that music meant to him. You look around and you start looking. And now I learn that when I'm on stage, what the fuck I'm saying is affecting them. That's what I took that night from there. I was blown away. I went home. I couldn't fall asleep. I had to pick my wife up the next morning at the airport. I couldn't fall asleep till 2 in the morning. I took the Gabba Gabba, the melatonin. I took a half of Xanax. I couldn't. I, I was scared to take the whole thing. I won't wake up. Nothing. I couldn't fall asleep because I was so overwhelmed from a live experience. So I appreciate you guys when you come to a fucking show because now I know even Thursday night in Albuquerque, I had a rough set. My two shows Friday night were fucking sensational. But Thursday night I had a rough set because I wasn't selling it. I, I had forgotten what I was there for. I think the airplane, something threw me off the fucking end. I don't know what threw me the fuck off. But it was still a great weekend. I had a great time at Santa Fe Casino, and everybody I had contact with were very sweet. The girls were very sweet, and it was just a great weekend. But no, I hope you uh, got something from this podcast today. 
because I think I wanted to talk about this. Not basically the fucking uh, people Facebooking me and shit, but I wanted to talk about the fucking uh, the comedy and what you're doing right now in your life that really is the same plan that we have. It seems better for Lee because he's doing comedy and he's understanding it more. But always push yourself and put yourself in weird situations. What do you got to lose? I'd rather you put yourself in a bad situation than a boss make you do something and you don't know it. At least now you understand the grasp of that situation. You ever work at a place like that? There was different levels and different promotions. Right, yeah. Let's say you started out, for example, like like I started at uh, the Puddle Car Wash. That's a fucking car drive. Okay. All right. But I would always talk to the general manager. Was I kissing his ass? No, he was from Philly or something. And I always talked to him during the breaks and shit like that. And he asked me if I could sell stuff. And one day, while I was drying cars out in the snow, I went over with him. And he showed me this hosting gig. And then shortly after that, I got a job at a body shop, you know, as a fucking, uh, as a shagger. And I was good at it. I was a good shagger. I finally got promoted to being a detailer, which was commission, which was pretty good. I'm, t I'm talking 1987. I'm, uh, I'm 24 years old. You know, I'm a fucking loser. I don't have a GED yet. This is pre-kidnapping, you know. And when I was a shagger, I was already detailing cars. I just wasn't a detailer by pay. But it didn't matter to me because I was still learning what to do. If you just went from shagging to detailing, it was like a three-week money contingency that you would lose money like a motherfucker. I already lost the money. When they would say who prepped that car, in those days we would prep them off the ship. Oh, okay. When you prep a car off the ship, it's completely different. It has, like, Cosmoline on it. It may be different today. And all the seats are wrapped. You got to do all that shit. And you got to screw in the mirrors. And there's a lot of shit you got to do when a car comes off the ship. It just don't come off looking like fucking Johnny Ferrara. There's a thousand things you got to do. The Cosmoline was the worst because you had to spray a certain chemical on it. Let it sit for six or seven minutes. Then rub it out fucking good. Wash it, wash it again, do another coating, wash it again. Then you had to give it a quick hand wax. And they would pay you like 24 bucks. You were a subcontractor. For each car? For each car. It was like 20 for fucking 24 for new cars and 55 for used cars. And they got $149 for the detail. You got 55 bucks. But if you could detail three fucking cars in one day, you didn't do bad. Is that possible? Oh, yeah. I, I I could detail three fucking cars in one day and two new ones. Wow. If I knew that there was a bunch of new cars, I'd get there at 6 in the morning. And I'd, I'd get two or three new cars, and then I'd get two used ones, and I'd fucking work them, Jack. I never, but my point is, I will always learn to do the job above me. Not because I wanted to steal that guy's job, because I wanted to be prepared when they offered it to me. Is that the weirdest fucking way of thinking? No, but that's how sense. I thought at yeah. that age. That's how I thought at that age. I always wanted to know Lee's job. I wanted to know Sam Tripoli's job. You know, if Sam Tripoli was your boss, I wanted to know his job. And I wanted to know what his job was. Because in my mind, I wanted to take the steps. And it made all that shit a lot easier. I never even did. It, it makes sense. I mean, I the only places I worked like that were, like at the movie theater, and I got promoted once to, from a red shirt to a blue shirt. But other than that, no. I mean, when when you come out when I came out here to be an editor, there's a path. But, and I guess you're right because I would sit and I would I would help my my friend edit or I would take editing gigs for for less money just to like learn. You're right. So I guess when you take it seriously. It's like it's like a, a what was it an apprenticeship almost. Yeah, and nobody can cut the corners for you people. Just do the fucking work, and the only way you feel better about yourself, you know, they can't take it away from you. That's why I get frustrated with those fucking emails. Just do the work. There's no fucking shortcuts. I'm out here with twenty guys that took shortcuts. 
and they're in fucking limbo. There's the, the, the only shortcut is the straight line between you and that fucking goal. That's it. Listen, like I said, all you got available is 419 in Columbus. It's a Thursday night show at 830. And there's a few tickets left for Saturday night working out. I got a couple bits I got to fucking tighten up. And you guys are going to be my fucking guinea pig 730 show. I got a few people going up for that. And that's it for right now, man. I'm happy you guys tuned in. We got a great podcast this week. The next four or five guests are fucking savages. So I just wanted to get you guys ready. We haven't done an old school one in a while. I know a lot of people ask me for him. So bam, there you have it. My main man, Lee. Oh, I know he's got bronchitis. He came all half a fact in here with the juke off drop. He even came in here with the fucking daytime night quote. Like he's trying to impress me. If he was a real gangster, he'd show up with the night, night, night when the triple X one. That kills bugs. It kills fucking hand jobs from Chinese people. That's the one you come in. He comes in with here with the orange one. It's fucking daytime. Hell. And then he wouldn't take a fucking edible or a I took, an, I took an edible. You said people well, I got to deal with. I, give me credit. I you took an edible. Got to deal with. He's got, he had bronchitis three months ago. No, I didn't. When he called me, the first thing he said to me was, I a got bronchitis. Ago. I can't go to the gym for a week. And I'm like, this fucking sack of shit. He's fucking trying to bullshit me. But now he's got bronchitis. He won't do a fucking bongarooski. I don't know why, but that don't matter anyway. Who gives a shit? All that matters is you, motherfuckers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you guys Wednesday. Tip top, Magoo. Number one, like I said in the beginning, listen. Fuji Sports has been around since Jesus left Chicago. That's why they call him Fuji, baby. Named after fucking Mount Fuji. Anything you need jujitsu. The fucking uh, leg things for Muay Thai. Shorts. A gi, which I highly fucking recommend. That I will highly, highly recommend. The Saparito, go the extra 20 and live like a doctor. Go to Fujisports.com right now. You find something you like, press in church and get 10% off. How's that one for you? And you know me, on it till the end. They've been with us since day one. Aubrey was here. His book came out. Take a look at it. He's a fucking lunatic, but he's a good man. Go to on it right now. Even I t- finally tasted the Mexican chocolate. Yes, it is. It's fucking delicious. The new milkshake. It's a little bigger container. Go for it. The protein. I got the alpha brain. You know me. The new mood. The shroom tech sport. The shroom tech immune. They got some tremendous jerky. Listen, go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. And take a look at all the great supplements they got. I can't take care of you with the metals and the poles. But as far as the fucking supplements, I got you. You know why? Because that's the type of motherfucker that I am. Listen, I love you guys. I'll see you guys Wednesday. Have a great fucking day today. And remember, next Thursday night, the 19th, me and Kate Quigley. That's all that's left. And I'm not adding two shows. I'm too old. And I'm going to have to shoot that fucking show. I'm dying up here. So I'm going to be too tired. I want to get you guys fresh, tip-top, magoo, and ready to fucking go. Have a great Monday. Stay black. Kick that mule leaf.